in or two after because we still have a couple people uh, filtering in. Um, <clears throat> we could start with some introductions, though. You bet. So, um, so I'll start. Um, I'm Randy Bias. Um, I am on the OpenStack Foundation Board of Directors. Um, I'm also a well-known figure in the OpenStack community, having been a part of OpenStack since its launch in 2010. So I guess we're five years into the journey now. Um, and uh, my company called Cloud Scaling, which was one of the early pioneers in OpenStack, built some of the earliest OpenStack deployments, and had two major customers, AT&T and Walmart, uh, was acquired by EMC last year. So thank you, EMC. Um, and um, for those who don't know, like before I was doing the whole cloud thing, I'm a long time infrastructure guy. So I've been doing information security, storage, networking, automation, all that stuff for a very, very long time, an uncomfortably long time, almost 25 years now. Um, and uh, then I'll let Jeff introduce himself. You bet. Hello, my name is uh, Jeff Thomas. I am a systems engineering leader for Scale.io, so I handle our pre-sales and make sure that our installations get done uh, properly most of the time. Great. <laughs> so um, for those of you, so first of all, it's great that we have such a, a, a great turnout here to see this today, and we're really excited to show you. But for those who aren't familiar, there was a blog posting that I did um, kind of talking about uh, the architecture of Ceph and what I saw as some of the problems. Um, and so, you want to go ahead and go to the next slide? And so, um, we decided to kind of talk about this, you know, and actually do a live demonstration and kind of show you Scale.io's perform performance versus Ceph. And the rationale behind this, and this is, this is a little bit funny because the Red Hat people were giving me a little bit of grief. They're like, oh, you're validating Ceph. And I'm like, I don't need to validate Ceph. Ceph's already validated, right? It's like 62% of OpenStack deployments, according to the latest user survey, um, are using Ceph. See, there I go, I'm marketing Ceph, my competitor's product, right? That's, that's how I roll. Um, but the point is, is that EMC has been doing block storage for a long time, right? I mean, we're the leader globally if you look outside of OpenStack. And so I thought it made sense to kind of, you know, really kind of bake these things off. You know, we, we're, we're the startup, I hate to say it, we're the startup, we're the little guy in OpenStack. Only 5% of OpenStack deployments use EMC storage. Part of my job is to change that. So we're here today to show you why. Um, so what's interesting, go ahead and next slide. What's interesting is that um, if you are thinking about uh, block storage, most people who want block storage are looking for performance because performance matters, right? I mean, tier one, tier two, tier three, right? You care about performance if it's tier one block storage, right? And so I think the challenge is you know, how do we determine um, why Ceph is so dominant? I think that in a large, uh, uh, there's a couple of different reasons why Ceph is so dominant in OpenStack. So I think the first is that it's multi-protocol, right? You get block, you get object, you get file. That's fine, that's great. Second is that it's open source and it doesn't have a lot of peers, right? It used to compete with Gluster and then Red Hat bought Ink Tank. So now they don't compete or something, I'm not sure. Um, but the point is, is that um, you know a lot of people. If you look at sort of the um, actual uh, data around the OpenStack user survey, the number one block device driver in, under Cinder is Ceph. Now, not Ceph file system, not Ceph object, but Ceph block. <coughs> um, and so I think that's interesting because I think most people are expecting high performance from block storage, right? But it's also interesting because the, even the Ceph folks will tell you that it's not really designed to be a high performance system, right? They'll tell you that really what it's supposed to be is a multi-protocol system. It allows you to have block, object, and file in a single uh, system, and it's open source, and it scales okay, which is fine. Um, so the blog posting and part of what we're trying to do today is really talk about why being multi-protocol is actually a problem, right? That's sort of the storage unicorn, right? You see this a lot now today. Customers come and they're trying to solve their problems in their data center and they're like, well, I want one software that does this and 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 this. And oh, it's all gonna do that perfectly well. Like all of that's gotta be, you know, really high performant and inexpensive and easy to manage. These things just don't exist, right? So single purpose tools sometimes are better, right? Would you rather, if you're out in the forest and you're camping, right? You know, you're Mount Fuji and you're camping, 
do you want a Swiss Army knife or do you want like a set of tools that will help you build a shelter for the night? It depends, right? If you're gonna be there for one night, probably a Swiss Army knife is good enough, right? If you're gonna be there for a week, you probably should have like a belt full of tools. Um, I think I covered a bunch of this. So these trade-offs, that's what the key is that, to look at today. It's like, how does Ceph achieve being multi-protocol, right? Because block, object, and file are all a little bit different. They all are trying to accomplish slightly different goals. And so some compromises have to be made. And so we want to show you what the result is of those compromises. So we decided to do this bake-off. And we're going to continue to look at this stuff. And so, um, you know, this isn't to say Ceph is bad, okay? So like I said, Swiss Army Knife, Ceph's appropriate for certain things. Um, if I was going to build a small system of, say, like five servers in a rack, and I didn't care about scaling it past five servers, and I didn't want to deploy, you know, EMC Scaleo plus EMC ECS plus EMC whatever, you know, then I wouldn't, I, you know, I, I would prefer Ceph, right? It would make sense at five servers. But I, I don't care about five server deployments. I care about like five rack and above deployments because that's the only way I think you get value out of cloud. That's my particular bias. All right, with that, I'm going to hand off to Jeff, who's going to start running us through this, and there will be lots of time. Um, we've got a few times where we're resetting the environment, so there will be lots of times to ask questions, um, to uh, poke fun, or whatever it is that you need to do. All right, thanks, Randy. So uh, just to reiterate, we are going to be doing a block bake-off. So Ceph does many things. We're going to be concentrated on the uh, RBD portion of it. When we look at the way Ceph works compared to Scale.io, I think a lot of you probably have a good notion of how this works. But for those of you that don't, um, Ceph is traditionally deployed in a kind of a two-layer client and server environment where um, you've got clients that are going to run the Ceph client. And then on the back end servers, you've got um, the, the Rados infrastructure, right, which lets us scale out and um, have the ability to you know, put as many servers as you want to scale out underneath that. So when a VM goes to write a block, it's going to write to that Ceph client. The Ceph client's going to push it down to RBD, goes through the object translation layer, through the Linux file system, and down to disk. For Scale.io, we have a similar approach. We have a notion of a client and a server. And that client um, is going to install in a hypervisor inside a, um, a Linux operating system we can deploy in both this two-layer configuration as well as a hyper-converged one. For the tests that we're going to do today, we're going to deploy it in two layers so that we have a very much like-to-like -like when we're comparing Ceph to Scale.io. As you can kind of see, as, as, we, as we build this out and we look at the, the data path that a particular block is going to take as it's written, there's a VM is going to write a block to a virtual disk. The Ceph client is going to receive that block. That's going to get sent to RBD. RBD maps to the Rados objects. That gets written to the file system and, and down to disk. So Rados is the common layer, the object layer that Ceph is using to basically allow multi-protocol heads, right? Yep. So, And it, it allows for the scaling out. So I can keep adding servers, and Rados is that layer that's going to let me um, have more and more servers as I scale that out. It knows where all the servers are in the cluster, and as a block request comes in through the RBD gateway, which is the block device gateway, it gets mapped into that object layer. And then it's not like a one-for-one -one mapping, right? I mean, the objects that Ceph uses are kind of fixed sizes, I think like a megabyte or something like that. Oh, Help me out. No, I don't mind if you huckle. That's why you're sitting up no front. RBD gateway. Huh? There's no RBD gateway. It does it on the client side. And then you just RBD, Rados protocol to talk to the OSD. OK. All right. Yeah, Thank no you. worries. I don't, I don't want this to be inaccurate. I appreciate any corrections. All right. So um, when Scale.io goes to write to, or our VM goes to write to a, a virtual disk, this, the Scale.io data client is going to receive that block. It's going to forward that out to the Scale.io data server, and that's going to go down to disk. So main point here, a lot less steps to get from the VM that's doing the writing down to disk. Yes. yes, this is all done over IP, Bo both uh, 
configurations. Uh, the question was, is this, um, is this all done over a TCP IP network? The answer is definitely yes. So with both the Ceph solution and the Scale.io solution, um, IP protocols are used. From a deployment perspective, um, as I kind of introduced there a minute ago, there's a Scale.io data client as well as a Scale.io data server. We're going to be uh, running our tests today in this two-layer configuration where we've got storage servers that are just uh, advertising out disk and clients that are consuming that, but we can run this very much in a hyper-converged way, and that's uh, what most of our customers actually deploy this in production as. Um, we've chosen to use um, Amazon, an Amazon instance here in Japan, to build out these tests. Um, we have a management network that we use to communicate the machines, as well as a storage network where the back-end storage traffic is going to go. The five client machines that are out there um, are running both the RBD client and our SDC client. And these are C4 large compute optimized instances that are out there. From the server side, we have five each of both Ceph and Scale.io servers. Uh, and we're going to start off with a test running with two devices on each one of those servers. Now, part of the reason we've chosen to use Amazon is we wanted to make sure we were giving the exact same resources to both Ceph and Scale.io. The devices that we're using are EBS devices that each have 3,000 provisioned IOPS. Provisioned IOPS means we're guaranteed by Amazon to be able to have 3,000 IOPS out of each one of those devices. Now, if we, if we look at the kind of performance that we should get, and, uh, and what we hope to show you today is that Scale.io can exploit all that underlying performance that is out there. So this first test that we're going to run, five hosts, two devices. So I end up with 10 of those 3,000 IOP devices, which gives me the ability or the IOP potential of 3,000 IOPs. Um, we're going to run a second test where we scale up that configuration. We're going to add devices to those same five servers, and then we'll do another one where we add five more servers, so a scale-out test with both. We're going to run a 50-50 read-write workload. Um, it makes it a little easier to kind of understand what's going on if we just run a single workload in the, in the short time period that we have here today. How big are the blocks? Uh, we're going to use a 4K block size. Okay. Um, if we look at what we're going to expect from an IOP potential, there's a notion of both front-end IOPs that the client sees, as well as back-end IOPs that happen on the storage. So Scale.io uses a two-copy protection scheme. We've got Ceph set up the same way to have two copies as well. So we'll expect to see 20,000 IOPs out of the Scale.io system. And then as we run these additional tests, we'll, we'll scale that up as well. And we should see this linear scaling then, right? You bet, absolutely. So the first test we're going to run through, um, 80 gig volumes on each of those five clients. We're going to kick off an FIO job and, and look and see what happens. And this is just a single thread FIO on each instance, basically? That's correct. Okay. All right, so we can uh, take a quick look here at the, the Ceph Health. Caching enabled. Caching enabled. We're not doing caching because we're effectively using SSD devices. Caching would slow us down. So caching is disabled at the clients when you run FIO? Yep. So for the Ceph config, you have the journal data on the same disk? Ceph config has the journal data on the same disk? Yes. So we can see here our Ceph configuration. We've got five machines, each with two devices. Uh, also SSDs, right? Also SSDs. Right, these are the EBS SSDs. These are EBS um, volumes with 3,000 guaranteed provisioned IOPS. So what's underneath there, that may be a whole bunch of physical disks, it may be a single SSD, Amazon's abstracting that away from us, but we'll see on a per device basis that we're getting those uh, 3,000 IOPS each. They didn't tell us we'd literally be in the hot seat today when we did this. <laughs> All right, so we, uh, we kick, kick this off. You can see some IO stat data up here. It may be tough to see in the back. Um, this SCINIA driver, that is um, 
That's my scale I.O. device, my RBD0. That is my um, Ceph device that's out there. If we uh, look at a, a Ceph minus W, we can see over here on the end uh, the amount of IOPS that we're getting out of each one of those. So we're getting roughly, you know, let's say 6,000 6, IOPS we're sustaining out of there. It's, it's bouncing up and down a little bit. Let's take a look at the scale I.O. GUI. What was that we were seeing? We were seeing 6,000 IOPS on a single system, or was that? This is the back-end Ceph report of how many IOPS are Across out the there. entire cluster. Across the entire okay, cluster. Got it. So that's the, dry, the load that's being driven by all five machines. Okay. So you're roughly getting 1,000 to 1,100 IOPS per machine there if you, okay. if you do the averaging there. If we take a look at the scale I.O. side, we can see we've got 20,000 front-end IOPS. So we were expecting 20,000. We're getting that full 20,000 out of it. We can look at the back end as well, and I, and I realize these numbers are going to be tough to see a little bit as well, but our back end IOPS, we're driving that full 30,000 IOPS. So we've given Scale I.O. the ability to have 30,000 IOPS to use, and it's using that entire 30,000. And on the front end client side, we're seeing that expected 20,000 IOPS. So we're getting everything that we expect out of that. Uh, yes. Okay, so what is the FIO reported IOPS? Because the Ceph, you know, I what is the FIO reported IOPS inside the client? So um, we can, the, when the job's finished, we can go in and look at those reports. But um, what we're really trying to demonstrate here is the, the back end IOPS that we're getting. Um, you know, if we look at the average of the, these numbers along here, it's roughly five or 6,000 IOPS on the back end total. Plus the read, if you uh, add up the read and write, then divided by the ops, then you get roughly about a 2K in over the block size. I think that's the problem of the safe bankhead reporting. So you're running the 4K, but if you look at the bankhead reporting, it's kind of reporting at the 2K in the block size. I don't know if you look at the detail of the safe W or not. Okay. So it's really not reliable. You cannot rely on this data to tell you the IOPS. So you have to look at the FIO. That's my point. Okay, well, we'll have that yeah. report here in a second, right? Yep. And you're saying that the Ceph backend can we, reporting can data... Can we capture that and show that? Or it's only if we run it... Um, I mean, I can kick off a, a, a separate FIO job on it and do it. Okay. Um, if... I, I guess if the, if the Ceph tool isn't reporting the right IOPS to us. Um, from a client perspective, we'd have to go to all five of them, run it, and look at them all individually. So we're trying to show it centralized here. We certainly, um, we have all the stuff running in our booth as well, and if we want to come, if you want to come down later and we drill into all of it, certainly happy to do that. Yeah, and happy to have you help us tune stuff if you like as well. Absolutely. No problem with that. I mean, I, the reality here is that you know, this isn't about Ceph bad. That is not what this is about, right? Ceph has a place, right? The argument we're making is that if you want high performance block distributed, that a pure tool, a tool that's designed for that end to end is ultimately better for the high performance use case. And if you don't want high performance block and Ceph's good enough for your use case, power to you, man, do it, right? No problem. Then actually, why you are comparing uh, Ceph and uh, Scale I/O? Well, see, the thing is, is that if you look at the majority of OpenStack block drivers, 62% of the OpenStack block drivers are using Ceph RBD, yeah, right? But they have a use case to use it. So it's, yeah, actually, I've I've talked to a lot of these customers, and the majority of them are using Ceph as as block storage only. They're not using it as multi protocol, which is what where it shines. That's that's a strength as in, um, as in being a single, unified, multi-protocol system, in which case Scale.io can't touch it. No, what I'm trying to say is my use case is actually a, a low performance, low cost storage. That's yeah, but you, the cost, there's no cost difference between these two systems. Uh, but actually, you, you never actually tell actually how the SDs actually do the work, right? You're talking about more on the step than actually Scale.io. How actually Scale.io works, what is actually the cost difference between the step and the step? There's no significant pricing difference between them. But I, I think it is. 
this isn't this isn't about you know doing a product pitch. Like if you want a product pitch, you come by the EMC booth, and we're happy to show you the numbers and talk to you about like scale AO cost versus Ceph if you like. That's not that's not what we're doing here. We're, what we're doing here is we're trying to examine the difference between a storage system that is designed for a specific purpose versus a storage system that is designed to handle multiple purposes. And this isn't even like a Ceph specific issue. It just happens to be a thing in the OpenStack community that's most widely deployed, so it's easy to talk about. I have this problem inside of EMC. I got like the Elastic Cloud Storage guys who built an object system who want to put block on top of it, and I'm like, no, please don't do that, <laughs> right? So this is about purpose-built tools versus multi-purpose tools, and why one is better than the other for particular kinds of use cases. You were gonna... Oh, the only point I was gonna make, you were asked about front-end IOPS. And the... the point on the front-end IOPS is that the IO stat that uh, will display will show both read and write IOs per second to the device for RBD0, as well as SCI and IA. So you can take, there are five clients, the output actually shows the five client outputs every th three seconds. So you can see that it is three, four, five hundred read and write IOs per Ceph client. Multiply that out and it's about 6,000 IOs per second. Um, hey, uh, I, I've, actually, <coughs> I've actually tried the same experiment uh, on Ceph. And I noticed, uh, but that was on a hard disk with uh, three machines, uh, not with SSDs. I noticed that Ceph uh, could max out uh, the IOPS that the disk could do, right? Uh, I've, I've done this myself. Um, sure. Did, did yep. this make a difference because it's SSDs uh, with uh, way more IOPS? Did that make a difference? Did, did we max well, out? Well, certainly so. So each, each device in Ceph is going to spin up a process and you can push so many IOPS through each one of those processes. So if you've got disks that only give you, you know, if you're using spinning disks, you know, at best 150 IOPS per, it's going to have no trouble keeping up with that. But when you start to get into devices that can do five or 10,000 IOPS a piece, then you're going to find that you're not going to be able to exploit all those IOPS with Ceph. The Scale.io doesn't max that on CPU. Uh, Scale.io at full bore doesn't usually use up more than 20%. But you know, there's, there's something here you need to keep in mind, right? There's, one of my guys used to tell me this all the time, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. Like, all of this has to be seen in context, right? The numbers like, vary about whether it's sequential or random, how big the block sizes are, like all of that stuff matters. Right, so this isn't about like, you know, trying to make either one of these systems look particularly better than the other by like jamming it up a certain way. It's to sort of try to get as close to apples to apples as you can for the block use case, even recognizing that Ceph being multi-protocol isn't designed inherently for block, but is used predominantly for block within the OpenStack uh, uh, community. And, you know, dominantly so. 62% of market share, like, any of us wish that we had that in our companies for our products. Sixty-four k block sizes random. I don't. I, I we're don't. not. We're not going to during this test because we had to pick one to kind of go through. We certainly can do that. Um, we tried to pick a workload that would be a standard virtualized workload. So. Most of the time, you're either seeing four or eight K blocks. You can certainly have, um, a, if you really want to test and tax a storage system, you can throw lots of massive blocks at it. Um, we chose to use a, a, a block size that was more common out there in the real world. OK, I'm, I'm going to hold you there, because I do want to get through our, our things. All right, I got you. You two want to, you're in the queue. I did not drop any IO yet. Um, so. Um, uh, so one of the, one of our intentions here as well, for those who are really curious and want to do this themselves, is we're going to try to generalize a lot of this because you know getting these things up and configured or at least you know 
Oh, I'm almost threw somebody in a bus. Better not do that. Uh, storage systems are can be complex to configure. So what we're hoping to do is actually have a set of recipes, you know, and some automation tools, and get them up in GitHub, so it'd be easier to deploy these clusters. So you could run them on Amazon yourself and play with them, and maybe uh, test it more easily without spending a huge amount of time getting that up. So that's one of my intentions. And if you watch the cloud scaling blog, which I still am blogging at, even though it doesn't seem like it sometimes, and there'll be some stuff up there soon. So All right, Jeff, so we did, wanna... uh, we did the reconfiguration. So we took our five each servers, and we reconfigured them with four devices versus two, and created volumes that, um, uh, and assigned them out to the clients. We look at Ceph, we see we've got um, five machines with four devices each now. So we're going to kick off that same test. And again, this is 50-50 uh, read-write workload. Um, 4K blocks, um, 32 um, IOs in the queue depth. So every five, every three seconds, we're getting all five of them reporting back from the FI, from the FIO side. If we take a look at at uh, Ceph minus W, we see we're getting a little bit more performance out of it this time. I'm running the clients concurrently. So they're both pushing the load at the same time. That's why we used heavy compute instances to, to run the load. So there's two FIO processes running in parallel. In parallel on each, on, the, on each of those five clients. So by looking at the IO set all the time, can you really cannot tell? It would be more interesting looking at it with one and sequencing one after the other, see how the IO set all the time can be disconnected. You know, we, uh, we did that. Um, several times and got the exact same result. So we decided to bring them together so that we could, you know. Yep. Kernel client or live RBD? It's kernel, kernel client. client. So that would be interesting to see you regenerate that. Response. Right. So let me repeat it. So, or you could have him repeat it if he's got the mic. Just I'll repeat it. He's so, so yeah, just uh, um, with an open stack, the kernel client isn't isn't really used. In fact, very few people use the kernel client. It's it's very minimal sort of use case uh, relevant there, um, mainly because it doesn't do any of the caching stuff. Most people use libRBD in, inside OpenStack, and with FIO, you, there is a native RB, libRBD driver as well, which you can use. But m most people will use that with the client side cache as well, and that's so. If you want to. Uh, I'm from Red Hat, so I'm generally interested to, for you to rerun this with that data and show okay. it in a more practical yep. use case environment. Well, we, we can certainly do that, but the really the, the, the intention of these tests is not to show that one does this much IOPS and the other does this much. It's more how much of that underlying infrastructure can you actually exploit. So if we change the parameters, yeah, our numbers may change a little bit. I would think the relative difference between them are, are going to stay the same. <laughs> Uh, a short detail question, please. Uh, you said IO death 32. Is that one thread with IO death 32 or four threads with eight each? Or what is one with 32? Thank you. One per client server. Yep. What's the version of Safe you're using? Hammer. That's the latest? Yes, I believe so. They're writing to different disks. They're writing to two entirely different sets of servers. So we're not running Ceph and Scale.io on the same servers. The back ends are separate. The clients are yeah. running off the same. Yeah. And so that's the just a. So the RBD0 is the Ceph device. The SCI and IA is the Scale.io device. And we're getting the output from all five of them there. So every three seconds, I'm putting that, that, that output to the screen.
Jeff, I just want to check on time. We have about 10 minutes left. I want to okay. make sure you get to it before we... So we are. We're starting to reconfigure the All last right. test here. All right. So you mentioned that um, you're going to start publishing this on like GitHub so that we can go and, and look through this. So there's um, some scaling issues that um, the OSD uh, daemon has with uh, saturating, OS, uh, saturating SSDs. So you actually need to run significantly more OSD processes per device if the device is capable of over about 1,000 IOPS each. Got it, and uh, it'll be on GitHub, so you can help us fix that. He jumped the line. He jumped the line, that's right. <laughs> so uh, how did you compare your results with Ceph with other published uh, uh, tests for Ceph in similar configurations? So I know there is a for Jesus test earlier on before Giant, there was Intel test. How do, how do those numbers add up? i actually not familiar with those tests. So uh, one thing that when Randy first published those results, I noticed that you reported something like 11 milli milliseconds uh, lag latency on Ceph side. And uh, Fujito study in the very same configura very similar configuration, 32 QDEPs and so forth, 4K random IOPS, was around 2.5. So you might want to check and see how it compares. Maybe there are some difference in configurations that you missed. Uh, was Fujitsu using Hammer or Giant? Giant. OK. All right, I'll, I'll take a note to go check that out. Now, I, I will freely admit that the performance engineers who did that were scale I.O. performance engineers. And if you know my reputation, I'm going to try to do this as fair as possible and be as honest as possible. So if they miss something, I'm more than happy to correct them and make it public. Yeah, which is why it's important to compare with other Yeah, same, you know, you got the same problem I do, man. There's so much time in the day. So I, 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 you, you call me on it, and I go fix it. All right, it's fair. Uh, you ready? Almost. Okay, one last question. Who is that? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, is, is scale I.O. Uh, split brain, say, fault tolerant? Yes. Uh, but, but you guys are doing mirroring, right? Uh, it's a two-way two replication. Yeah, so we're, the client's going to write to the SDS, the, the daemon process that controls all the disks that are on a particular host. As that write goes down to the primary SDS, uh, simultaneously, as it's writing that, committing that to disk, it forwards it to another SDS, which then will commit that to disk, acknowledge back through the primary, and let, and acts the client. So, it's more of a two-stage write commit than I'd say a synchronous replication. But but without quorums, you can't be split brain safe. Well, it, it's quorums definitely built in. So. In addition to the client and the, the daemon process that controls the DAS, there's uh, clustering software that controls the, the health of the system, and it's what you interface with in order to do configuration. We're almost there. We got... Okay. The other thing to, to keep in mind is that the, the, the scale AO has been optimized for this high performance use case. And so, you know, it's got this notion of protection domains. You don't have like an infinite size pool for scale IO. You uh, do it in sort of these little kind of subclusters called protection domains. And it might be a rack, a quarter rack, whatever size you want. And, but what we're optimizing there for is for very fast disk rebuilds. That's why it's only a two-way replication. And we're optimizing so that we don't get a cascade failure. If you have a failure within a single production domain, it shouldn't cascade over and cause a problem in the next uh, production domain. So it's a little different. So if you were really smart, what you would do is you would actually have a production domain on like a single switch, <laughs> right? Because the chance of a switch failure is basically nil. A single switch failure, with, and you might lose a port, but then you lose that set of disks in that box. Big deal. So the odds of sort of that split brain scenario actually go down with like a, a well architected uh, system, which isn't to say that everybody well architects their systems, but. Well, and, and even within that protection domain, we can have different types of media within the host and create pools, and that really is your, your fault domain, is each pool within that protection domain. Hey, Randy, uh, just a quick question about uh, profiling. In true OpenStack and community fashion, uh, is it possible for us to, to run these ourselves and start comparing them amongst the community? Because uh, yeah. right now your, your license says that we're not allowed to publish those. Is there a way that we can work with you to do that? Yes, there right. is. What, um, what, what is the best so way for, for people right, that want to run this? To, so to so for it? right now, because of my legal team, <laughs> please contact me 
and I will help you get it done. Don't worry about what your results are. I will fight the battle with my legal team, okay? You, you publish them, you do me the reciprocal favor of being as fair as you can, <laughs> and, you know, and, and I'll get it passed through for you through the legal team. Now, I did go to bat with them, and I did try to get it done, but they, uh, there was a high, high level of resistance. And you know that uh, EMC is a business that's trying to become a different kind of business, that is sort of set in its ways. Right, so I, I just have to go right now do that one at a time. I, I apologize for that. Hopefully, once we get it done once or twice, I can just get them to change the end user license agreement, which is asinine anyway. So Randy, what's your Twitter handle again for people to? Seriously, Randy Bias. It's really hard to remember. <laughs> All right, so we just kicked off this final test. Ten machines, each with four devices each. You can see there we're getting, uh, we're getting more IOPS this time out of Ceph. If we go over and look at Scale.io. Why is it scrubbing? Can it's, you go back? Yep. Um, we, we just, we, we added those, we added four more machines to the cluster and created those volumes. You'll see this, uh, this, this calm down in just a second. So we need to wait for it to calm down before. We can, we, we can run it again as soon as this, this run finishes. But we can see we're getting, you know, there's 14,000. You know, it's jumping around a little bit, to your point, with the scrubbing going on there. But we're still, you know, I'd say we're averaging and probably closer to 10,000 with this run across those numbers. So I know what a scrub is on ZFS. What's a scrub on Ceph? It's rebalancing the pages because you added the new. I see. It's rebalancing the references to, to the storage on disk. It rebalances the data. Right. But the device is all deleted before the OSC branded. So basically, all the images were deleted. All of the Ceph LUNs were deleted, the images. Mm -hmm. Then in 20 OSDs were added. And then volumes were provisioned. So I'm not, obviously, there is a little scrubbing going on, but. Like we intentionally software. deleted the devices so that... Right, so we'll, I, I kicked it off there again. We can see the scrubbing stopped. And um, you know, the variability is still there a little bit. We're, yeah. we're, we're going up and down. But in general, the numbers are higher there. Um, as we, I think if we average those out again, we're looking at around uh, 10,000. When I look at the scale I.O. side, I'm getting 50,000 on the front end and about 70 on the back end. And if you remember back to my presentation, I said I was expecting to get uh, much more than that. Uh, reason we're not getting as much on this scale I.O. run is we're not pushing on it that hard. So I can run another FIO job, push it, push it a lot harder, and drive that full 120,000 IOPS on the back end. Can you actually push it so it drives 120,000 to the disk flat out? Yep. Do you have a time with you after this and actually look at it in real time with you, if that's okay? So, but, I mean, I'm more concerned about, you know, the numbers that you really ought to have. Right. Because uh, if you look at a Zcash W report, it's really not replacing the two IOPs. Yeah, but Jeff this is pretty is close. Yeah, it is. Jeff, we've got about one minute left. Okay. Just a quick thing. Uh, a couple of things. So first is, what is your ratio between reads and writes? 50-50. 50-50. And uh, do you do any caching at the scale outside? No. So there's no caching at all? Completely? Not in this I mean, test. We certainly can configure the system to do that. When we use um, SSDs or high IOP devices, uh, putting cache in front of them actually slows them down. So we turn off cache on the scale I.O. side. So if anyone has additional questions, we are running oh, the same demo live. I have, I have scale I.O. t-shirts for everybody who <laughs> answered a question and everybody who's from Red Hat. <laughs> <laughs> so please feel free to come down to EMC. Make sure you get the right size. If, 
If you didn't get it the first time, uh, Dolores will give you another one. But thank you very much. Yes, really thank you. It.